like impressive effects. <coughs> now, you have to keep in mind, like the ambient light in here is just like, this is bright. So if we were to do a session right now, you have to take into account that the ambient light is flooding everything. And if you did this in a dark room, that would be the opposite, where you know, even a small light is bright in darkness. So you always have to be considerate of ambient light levels, because it may have been 5% for that person last time, and you come back, and now it's evening. They came in the daytime, but now it's evening. You think, oh, it was 5%, but the ambient light is 50%. You have to be sensitive to ambient light. The brighter the light, the brighter that can be. The lower the light, the lower that can be. Now, for myself, in my typical... I have a room in which I have it set. It's kind of middle to slightly dark. I have like blackout curtains that I can use. For myself, I typically, you know, I'm at about 15%. But partly I have a relationship, I have an expectation, and also I work with the brain gym a lot. So what I find is that I'm quite comfortable at that level. Lower levels are fine, higher levels are not fine. But that level is, you know, it's like you get in your car and you play the radio and you turn on the music and you drive home. Isn't it interesting the next day when you get in and the radio turns on at the volume that it was at before, and you go, whoa, or gee, that's not much. You know, so there is that subjectivity. Um, you can change the light intensity in the middle of a session by putting it on pause. So when it pauses, it doesn't stop. Whatever is the signal when you push pause will continue. Mm -hmm. But while it's continuing, you can monkey with the sound. Pardon me, with the light intensity. So you can move your light bar up or down. It's like, oh shit, you know, they're, they're going like that. And you say, that was a mistake. Or you think, mm, that's not much. Put it on pause, adjust the light bar, then push play again. And it will have adjusted. And of course you can adjust the volume any time, but they'll know that, you won't know that. Um, so that's one thing about the, uh, the light intensity. But that was a wise insight, that you can decrease the level of demand of any composition by decreasing the general intensity of the light signal. That's good. Uh, there's a lot of people that we might want to characterize more like canaries because they're so delicate and sensitive. And mm -hmm. They kind of find their way to our practice. So yes. it seems like I've had to do that with almost everyone. Well, maybe your expectation is what a, a normative light intensity is, is more than it is. Um, also, you'll notice, if you're not paid, or you don't know, the, that every session has what's called the introvert-extrovert scale. Uh, it, I took a risk here, but I thought, because of the canaries, that there are people, basically the introverts are less... Uh, receptive to excitement. And the extrovert oftentimes is very comfortable. Well, you know, the extrovert would want to see fireworks in the sky where the introvert is very pleased with gazing at the full moon. Right? So uh, it's an extension of the characterization that I attempted so that I characterized every one of the 80 sessions on an introvert extrovert scale. You know, the higher the number, like the introvert or extrovert, and some are 50-50. Uh, I had no intention of doing that when I composed them. I didn't have the concept. I did more research. I thought that might be helpful from that point of view. So after I did all the 80, I did that. And I thought, well, geez, I wonder how many there are that are more extrovert, how many more introvert, and how many are 50-50. You can't divide 80 by 3, but it's almost exactly one-third, one-third, one-third. I had no intention of doing that. But fortunately, it worked out that way. So about a third of them tilt more towards your canaries. The other third tilt more towards what? I don't know, the eagles. And, um, and about a third of them are rather balanced with the two. She's going to call me back on Wednesday. I got an emergency. All right, bye-bye. Okay, Wednesday. <laughs> 10 o'clock. Okay. Um, it's uh, it's 3.30. We still have a bit more time. And um, what remains to be explored is more of the brain shaping long term, right? And also what remains to be explored are
recommended or associated neuroplastic reinforcements in movement and mental and even sensory because you know it's great to send a person off with an action strategy and that action strategy ideally would be any form of neuroplastic reinforcement that is going to help increase and sustain the vector or the goal of whatever you're doing. Now, in the, the monster doc, which I did not print out, I printed out part of it, uh, there are at least, I'm trying to remember, five or six things that I've written <coughs> that are in that category of neuroplastic reinforcements that are so flexible, so they kind of have a general nature, but they're still dynamic. And, you know, I guess one of the things that I, I know I'm going to have to do is create a document specifically on <coughs> stuff you can recommend, yeah. right? And what you're going to see, I expect, is that there will be probably six or seven in the movement category, mm -hmm. six or seven in the mental category, and maybe two or three in the sensory category. And you say, well, there, you know, there are a lot more vectors and themes, but the beauty is that these selections have a, a utilization that covers a lot of your bases. A lot of them. You know, the... Um, hey, come on in. This is Sergio. He was there yesterday. He's coming okay. here uh, to pick up something. Can you sit a little bit, or do you have to run? Okay, grab a chair. Welcome. He was uh, yesterday uh, throughout the day, so he has some exposure to the Neuralite. You're welcome. Um, Dad, can I make a suggestion? Sure. You can certainly say no to. Um, do you think there it would be appropriate, since we have 30 minutes left, just mm -hmm. to leave them with a, a treatment session with somebody? Just one? Or do you think you have... No, there's more for us to talk about, okay. I feel. Um, yeah, because we have to pick who and what does everybody else do in the meanwhile. And Just to watch you actively do the interview process. Well, we've sort of we've sort of done that. Um, what I was thinking tomorrow is we have at least one person coming, as I understand, mm -hmm. that you've been treating. Uh, if anybody, if we know, I'd like like two more people that I've not met that could use some help right now, that are not in this circle. As, as long as they, uh, as long, but it's help right now. I'm not getting into like, you know, car contacting aliens or anything, you know, like, um, or pathologies. But it's also interesting to work with a person that has evident pathology, knowing that we can always give you some help right now anyway. You know, I may get another person. Okay. Who had traumatic brain injury? Can we get somebody like that like, doesn't have like their their neck cut off or something? It's extremely functional. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. It's fine. Yeah. But you know what I'm hoping? Because so this is a medical practice. I mean, and, and you're working in relation to a medical practice, and you're in a, a wellness zone. But we know these things blur and blend together. Uh, what I'm hoping is that. At a popular level, soon, as a lifestyle issue, more and more people will be interested in total brain wellness, right? And as a consequence, they're not coming in because they're suffering from something horrible. They really want to work towards wellness. So I'd like at least one example of somebody that is not, you know, ill in any kind of overt way or suffering any kind of degenerative pathology. Uh, not in the circle. Yeah, somebody that doesn't know. Like, you know, Sergio yesterday, you know, we'd not met before, it was a nice feeling, we did the interview thing, and we went through it, and I'll just end up at the end point, right? Is that uh, he has found himself in a constantly worrisome state. About blah, 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 blah. And, you know, that was where we went, was to help right now, partly through clarity and discussion, 
partly through an action strategy after, and then we did a Neuralite session. I guess, what, here it is, you know, a day later, how would you describe, it, just in general terms, the experience yesterday and how you're relating to the worry thing today, if you don't mind, that would help them. As a kind of center, it's centering. It's a centering experience, and something more. Uh, I, I felt more stable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, had to do some work, uh, mm -hmm. professional work uh, during the weekend, and we did that after. Yeah. And I had to finish. It's like a technical stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's also proposals, so yeah. it's, uh, you know, we will uh, maybe result in a project. Okay. But here so you are, it's, tw I, it's 24 yeah. hours later. How do you feel? Still stable. Stable. It sense not to get into the extremes of wars, mm -hmm. being worried. Do you feel uh, more or less or anything about the noticing that you had been worrying? What about that, that thing? Yes, I do notice when I, you know, I sleep a little bit into sure. the notice I come off. The other part is I actually slept pretty well. You slept pretty well? Yeah, like uh, yeah. seven hours. Yeah, which is unusual for you. Yeah, it's more like six hours. This was like I, I had to wake up because I really had to get to the bathroom. You know, uh -huh. I'm yeah. interrupted sleep up to. Okay. So, you know, this is, thank you. This is a very good and reasonable report from a, you know, a simple interview. And actually there were people sitting there, so it wasn't even private. And we came to that thing, he identified that he was, hi, that he was actually, he was having something that he had to work with. And he was also worrying about it on top of it. And the worrying is, is what I, I call a, a, a uh, it's like a, a waste of imagination. Worrying is like a waste of imagination, right? So, and also we had uh, an action strategy because he knows for his goals he has to be more active. He's already been told to get more exercise, to get outside and walk and so on. So do you recall that this reinforcement was to visualize taking a walk. Not take the walk. We didn't want to push it that far too fast because then it's easy to fail. But we know when you visualize an activity with your body that the brain is actually 95% firing as though you're doing it. It's like the Russians doing the, right, the, the mental rehearsal in the Olympics. So he's doing a technique of mental rehearsal of getting out and doing his exercise walk. You, know, you don't create, you know, it's like I said yesterday, people ask me, what is the best exercise? And I always have the best answer, right? It's the one you're going to do. The theory about what is best is irrelevant. You know, what are you actually going to do? So I didn't want to jump and push. You know, they told you to get out and walk, do it. No, do it mentally. Right? Just sit, you know, you're just sitting there and mentally walk. Take your walk. Feel what it's like. Look around in your imagination. That way the habit is already being created. He's already halfway there before he takes his first walk. And he's not worrying so much because he's already doing something about it. He's walking mentally. You know, so anyway, thank you. I just wanted to, this is an example of one day later where, you know, the way he expresses it, you know, more, more stable, more centered, I slept better, you know, that's all good. That's help right now. And also, it would point towards the basis of a long-term strategy in shaping the brain, right? It points because there's a worrisome tendency, there's a punishment for not doing what you're supposed to do, then you feel like you're not doing it, then you feel even worse because you're supposed to do it, but you're not doing it, now I'm worrying about the effects, it's like, oh man, man. you know, it's, that's why there's so many of the feeling states, as I told you, in, in compositions, there are two kinds of compositions, one that tell a story, the other that explores a feeling. 
And it's very difficult to get into the story if the feeling state is not cooperative. I just don't feel like it. Oh, come on, no, I don't feel like it. You know, oh, what do you think about that? I don't know, I don't give a shit. You know? it, it, so, because we are feeling creatures that think, and not thinking creatures that feel, so much of the movement, when you start right there and now, is you start in the feeling states. Don't try to work with the person they want to be. Work with the person they are, and help them move towards the person they want to be. Otherwise, you know, it's, if you aim too far and you don't succeed, even though you've gone halfway, you think you failed. By another set of expectations, you've gone twice as far as you thought you could. Right? So, you know, it's that, it's, it's that interp a feeling state interpretation that sets up so much either success or failure in the evaluation. The Neurolite is an instrument. And it's built on design principles. Neuroplasticity is more important than the Neurolite. Right? So, you know, let the person start to feel hope and faith, like reading the Doge and stuff or listening to it, right? You feel inspired. Empowered and inspired. Yeah, uh, Norman Doge, the, the books. You know, uh, he, uh, he, some of you know, we mentioned, uh, he's a medical practitioner, doctor, researcher, specializing more and more on neuroplasticity, and he takes case studies and turns them into stories. And you read these things. Should be required reading. Should be, okay. It's now required reading. <laughs> right? Uh, what did you get out of it, Kai? The, the Deutsch books. D O I D G E. Um, having a better appreciation for the potential of change by supporting neuroplasticity opened up, um, I think, a whole new world of. Hope mm -hmm. um, and inspiration, and um, I keep coming back to the world of the word being feeling empowered mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. by the the resources available now to us, yes. um, but inspired and empowered. Yeah, yeah, and I think the the reality and the challenge with working with neuroplasticity depending on what you're needing to accomplish and the goal, is the commitment, is the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, um, but that's not to say it's not a, one of the most worthy investments you could um, mm -hmm. commit to mm -hmm. um, in your day, is, is the time. The, w what I see is something like this, from specialization into popular culture. At least in the West. I live in Thailand, so, you know, I... The first big wellness factor that translated to popular culture was the appreciation of stress. The whole concept of stress. Before that, you know, there wasn't really any designation or recognition. It's just, you know, life is hard or you're having a... You know, there are all of these different... Ad but then stress, that we identified stress. And it moved over into popular culture, became a, you know, a common term. If you ask any person about stress, they say, oh yeah, stress will kill you. you know, they, they, we know about it. And then the, the next thing that, that came along after stress was the idea of uh, fitness and exercise. That it was good to do that, that it really made it, it wasn't just jocks that would go to the gym and lift weights. That exercise, I mean, the first popular exercise was running, right? But this thing, and then aerobics, and the whole concept of exercise and fitness took a step along with stress. So, you, and one of the ways of reducing stress was exercise. It's like, oh, wow, this is all fantastic. I mean, moving is really good. All of a sudden, women were exercising, where most women never exercised because it was associated with men and jocks and the whole thing. And now, I mean, look at, you know, look at this, right? There you go. So it crossed over into popular culture. And then after that, nutrition, where good foods and, you know, healthy foods and organic, and again, it became moved from a niche into popular culture. You can ask any person about stress, exercise, and nutrition, they're going to have opinions, not necessarily the same, but, you know, it's recognized. It's no longer a thing that this is my life, and 
I, I do this thing in my life and then I take it out and my life is better, stress, exercise, nutrition just becomes a lifestyle, right? I mean, it's all a lifestyle for you. Then the next step mostly was about the heart, heart health. Because heart disease, coronary disease is so much, and all of a sudden, oh, you know, nutrition and exercise and stress, you could see it coming in as the issue of the heart. You can ask anybody, it's okay if they're crying, you can ask uh, anybody about heart health, right? I mean, I ask you about, you know, what can you do to, to help with your heart? Yeah. Hmm? What, what can you do to help with your heart? Help keep your heart... Well, exercise. One okay, what well, exercise is one thing. Give me another thing. Diet. Diet. Okay. See, everybody can make a comment about these things. It's popular culture. What can you do for your brain? Exercise. Okay. Turns out to be true. Puzzles. Hmm? Puzzles. Puzzles. See, that's like we, something about puzzles or cognitive or neuroplast. But you see, it kind of. It doesn't, like, uh, brain. You know, there is no bypass surgery for your brain. Right? You can have by I mean, the heart can even be transplanted, which is one more. But there's no bypass surgery for your brain. It's like, well, okay. How about another, how many of you want to live long? Live a long life. Right? Okay. Right now in industrialized com countries like ours here, if you reach the age of 80, there's a 50% chance of senile dementia or Alzheimer's. So, happy birthday, you're 80, flip a coin. You either have senile dementia, Alzheimer's, or you're okay. 50-50 risk right now. Would you like to do something to decrease your risk? Since you exercise and have nutrition and your heart lasts, your body makes it to 80, but you haven't done a damn thing <laughs> to help your brain, <coughs> would you like to know some things to keep your brain well into your long life. I suggest that we do, including me, I suggest it. Look around, look at the talk of Alzheimer's, look at the talk of other degenerative, the Parkinson's, the MS's, all these things. You know, wouldn't you like to do something about it? Look at how young you are. I mean, you know, if you want to live a long life, you know, do you want to just go with the flow, whatever happens to my brain happens? And, and gamble 50-50? Or not? Right? Kind of interesting, like the brain gets more interesting. I predict, maybe foolishly, but I predict the next aspect of wellness to penetrate popular culture is brain wellness. And when you're referring to the brain, you're not talking just about the, the soft matter in the skull. Well, we start there. Um, if you follow psychophysiology and biology and evolutionary theory, we have f actually four brains that act as one brain. <coughs> um, there are creatures on this earth that have no brains. They're on the streets everywhere. <laughs> no, right. the, they only have a spinal cord. And it's purely a reflex meeting point. Worms and things like that. And for them, their brain, it's okay, kids are kids, right? the, 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 the brain is, is actualized in what we call the skin. The, the skin is the first brain organ. And you only need, you only need a spinal cord for it to work. Okay, the, then evolutionarily you get the, the low brain and the evolution of, of the, the gut brain. So we've got the skin brain, the gut brain, which are always talking to each other. Then the brain develops more and you get the cardiac brain, the heart brain. And then in the final stages you get the cranial brain. The central nervous system grows from the bottom up. It doesn't grow from the top down in terms of evolution. So that's the way the brain developed. <coughs> and 
the, the, the organ vestige of it is skin, gut, heart, cranial. That's actually the brain. These four things act in unification as one whole. We know now that there are more afferent messages going to the cranial brain from the gut than from the brain, the cranial brain to the gut. That there's more information coming up than there is going down. And you know, in Taoism they knew this. You know, you have, it's called the, the three Dan Chen, the three seas of energy, right? Cranial, cardiac, and gut. Mm -hmm. And then they have the, the whole system of the meridians in the skin. So what you have is you have the four stages, the four steps. So when I say total brain wellness, it can either be total wellness of the brain, you think the brain is the thing in the skull, which I, I let people think, total brain wellness, or it's wellness of the total brain. And the realization is that neuroplasticity is actually the entire body is neuroplastic. The entire body is neuroplastic. And that the way we, we chop and divide is because our philosophy is we're reductionists, we're not holists. So we're much, we're very, it's like when I was a kid I had this little robot, very early robot, battery powered and, you know, it just... Uh, uh, Anyway, one day I took it apart, put it back together again, and there were two pieces I could never figure out where they went. The robot still worked, so I figured it must have been like the appendix or something. You know, it's like, what is this? And this is the problem that when you take things apart, it's like the big quest for the mind-body connection. That assumes they're disconnected. So many answers are flawed because the initial question is itself flawed. So we have to be very careful to wonder how can we make these things connect. I'll make this short. A long time ago there was a famous magician in Canada, Doug Henning, and uh, I'll show you how far back. Uh, he did a TV special and Bill Cosby was the host and he was still a good guy at that time. So, okay, Doug Henning did all these magic tricks, and they were incomprehensible. It's like, this is... <sighs> so at the end of this thing, I watched it on TV. No, it wasn't black and white TV. And um, at the end, Doug Henning says to Bill Cosby, the host, would you like me to show you how I did everything? He said, yeah. He said, I'll show you how I did everything. He said, okay. And they came down to the edge of the stage, sat right on the edge of the stage, their feet hanging over, and like the first people were there, because in front of a large live audience, it was a TV. So, okay, Bill Cosby's here, Doug Henning is here, and he has a stack of newspapers and a bag like that, a brown paper shopping grocery bag. So he gives the bag to Bill Cosby. He says, okay, take the bag, don't let me touch it, check it out, do everything you want. He looked, and looked and it's just a paper bag. He says, don't let me touch it. Said, okay. Then he took the newspapers and he says, okay, I'm going to shred all these and put them in the bag. You hold the bag, don't let me touch it. So he takes, whoosh, rip and rip and rip and rip. There's many, many newspaper pages ripping and ripping and put them all in the bag. He said, okay, close the bag, don't let me touch it. Okay, close it. A a magic word, he said, I don't know. He, says, well, he said, okay, abracadabra. He said, okay, don't let me touch it. Now open the bag, reach in and pull out what you see. He reached in, he pulled out, and all the papers were whole. All the shredded papers were one piece again. And it was just like stunning. It's just, your mind just like froze. It's, Wait a minute. And he said, okay, now I'm going to show you everything I did that I just did now, and I'm going to explain it. He said, okay. I said I have the papers, you saw them. I gave you the bag, you inspected it. I didn't touch it, you wouldn't let me, that's good. Then I said, I'm going to tear up the pages. And I took them up, and I tore the pages and put them in. I told you I was going to tear them. You expected me to be tearing them. I made movements like I was tearing them, because I said I was tearing them. You heard sounds of me tearing it, 
because I told you I was tearing them. And I put them in the bag. I never tore them. Because, you're, because I told you I was going to, you believed me. Because I made motions, you believed me. Because I dragged my thumb, and he showed how he did it. I made sounds with my thumb on the paper that sounded like tearing. And I put them in, you had already believed and decided that they were ripped apart, and you didn't know how I put them back together. They were never, ever, ever in pieces. They were always one thing. I learned so much from that, maybe in retrospect, but that in the reductionist systems, our style of philosophy is to take things apart, to reduce, 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 so that we've got all the parts and pieces, and then like my robot, try to put them back together again, thinking that they're separate. Like, you know, the simplest example, I, I taught a lot of anatomy and physiology over life, like respiratory and cardiac, two different systems, right? They're listed as separate systems. And yet, when you look at the physiology and anatomy, they're inextricably linked as one thing. The blood flows in through the lungs and back to the heart, and you actually can't separate them. But conceptually, they're separated. So then the task is, how do I conceptually link them based on my expectation that they're separate? And Doug Henning proved the fact that it's very easy to trick yourself into thinking that things are separate so that you can better understand them, and then try to figure to put them back together again, and it's hard. What's hard is your concept. So, total brain wellness, that's why I keep on saying the body is the brain, the brain is the body. These kinds of things. Breaking down the, the difficulty, the mystery of how to relate to this thing. That's why I say, listen, if you want to know the condition of the brain, just kind of just look at the person. You're going to be pretty, pretty damn close to making a, a close, you know, a reasonable evaluation. You know? I don't know if you said it or if I read it, mm -hmm. maybe both, <coughs> but that the um, body obeys the mind and the body doesn't lie. Oh, something like that. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Um, in, in the 80s there was a famous book that came out as part of this whole swishing movement called The Body Doesn't Lie. And the fact is, is that in certain conditions the body lies all the time. Uh, the emotions lie and your thinking lies. So that's the hook and the lead, thanks, for tomorrow. It's 4 o'clock. We'll meet tomorrow at 10. And we're going to go Wednesday. into... Hmm? Wednesday. Wednesday, thank you. We're going to meet Wednesday. Wednesday at 10. And where we're going to pick up is the strategy towards shaping the brain long-term, having spent a day with a number of things and the interview style and positioning yourself for help right now, short-term, long-term, neuroplastic motor and mental reinforcements, and whatever else. Plus, I'd like to more towards, if we can do like 2 o'clock for the, for the people to come, if that's possible. Um, you know, 2 is sufficient, 3... Uh, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. <laughs>